Well, good evening. So glad to see each one of you here this afternoon. And I pray that uh, you came expecting to receive a blessing. And I'm going to do my very best to keep everybody from, from dozing off. I know that uh, sometimes uh, a mid-afternoon uh, meeting is um, a little drowsy, especially if you ate more than you should have for lunch. Last night, we had a great storm that swept through the Dayton area, and it knocked out the electricity in certain areas and just sheets of rain. I mean, it was a terrific storm, and I went outside to stand on the porch to watch it. And uh, a big bolt of lightning came down. It looked like it was uh, actually in our front yard, but I know that it was farther away than that because when lightning strikes that close, the, the thunder is immediate. You know, it just is right there with it. But the lightning uh, struck, and then about three seconds later, the thunder came with a very sharp report. I mean, it was just a very crisp explosion. And I thought about the time when Satan will stand on this earth and lightning will come down to the ground all around him and thunder, powerful thunder that's so loud that it shakes the ground, people will believe that they're standing in the very presence of God. Such is the power that we're discussing and describing here. And then so as I made my way back into the house, I decided to go through uh, the garage. So I walked through the back door of the garage and the lights were out in the garage. And up on the wall in our garage, there's a little button that you push to open the garage door. And, it, and it's lit up at night. You know, it's got a little um, neon light in it. So not very bright. In fact, you wouldn't even notice this little button except in the total darkness. And as I looked around to try to get my bearing as to where I was in total darkness, I looked and there was that tiny little light. And I knew it was by the door. And if I could just get to that light, I would get through the door. And as I got through the door, this verse came to my mind, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star rises in your hearts. You know, God's word is all that we're going to have to lead us through the dark times ahead. And when the when the lights of the world are all blown out, so to speak, and darkness has covered the face of earth, what will you look to? What will you turn to for your guiding light? I hope it's the Word of God. And if you don't understand the Word of God, it won't be much help to you. True or false? You need to understand now. You need to study now. You need to prepare now that you might understand and be prepared. With that in mind, let's stand for the invocation. Our Father, which art in heaven, as we open your precious word this afternoon to study, we pray that you will give us that light, that we might look and see Jesus, the bright and morning star, the star that shines above all others, the star that if we keep our eyes upon will take us safely through the door into heaven's eternal rest. As we open our, uh, the, your word this afternoon to studies, open up our minds and our hearts to receive the presence of the Holy Spirit as our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Be seated. Well, I have several things to share with you today, and I need to move along quite rapidly in order to cover them. And uh, so let's get started and jump right in. Thursday night, we covered the six trumpets, what they represent, what they are. I'd like to just go over that quickly again, just to make sure that they're in your mind. The, six tr uh, the seven trumpets, actually, we've only studied six, but the seven trumpets are seven judgments that God is going to send upon the world. The purpose of these judgments is to awaken the world 
to the realization that they need a Savior. The purpose of the trumpets will have such an impact upon each person living on this earth that every person will recognize the need for a Savior. Now, some will turn to an imposter Savior. Others will turn to, by faith, a Savior they can't see. But the point is, is that by the time we get down to the second coming of Jesus, everyone will be worshiping a lamb. One will be worshiping the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. One group of people. Another group of people will be worshiping the Lamb-like imposter upon the earth. Everyone will be worshiping a Lamb. I'll speak more about that when we study the two beasts of Revelation. The point I want you to understand is that these first judgments that God sends upon the earth is a time of mercy. These are the seven first plagues. These are the seven trumpets. And then God has seven last plagues for those who receive the mark of the beast. This entire time is called, appropriately in the book of Daniel, a time of wrath. Whose wrath? God's wrath. And why is God's wrath being expressed upon the whole earth? because of a cup, a cup that has reached full, the full cup principle. Remember our first study, the full cup principle, because the sins of the world have reached a place where God's wrath must be exercised, just like it was in the days of Noah, just like it was in Sodom and Gomorrah, just like it was promised upon Nineveh. God allows sin to go so far, and he says, that's it, that's the end will not tolerate anymore, and he moves into action. You're well acquainted with the full cup principle if you were here the first study. You'll need to recall some of the things that we said in, the, in that first study because you're going to see them reapplied. I'd like for you to flip over in your Bible to Daniel chapter 8. I want you to look very quickly here and verse 19. Do you remember that Daniel 8 is that big capsule that big pill with all those little parts in it that dissolve down through time, down through history. You remember that? Just in case you don't have forgotten, remember my 24-hour contact for runny nose? Well, this is the way this prophecy works. It has all of these little capsules in it that dissolve and appear at just the right time. But there is this one big one that applies specifically at the appointed time of the end. The only way we can know that we're living at the appointed time of the end is to follow the chronological progression of the prophecies. And that's why the apocalyptic structures are so important. By following Daniel 2, we can see that we've reached the end. By following Daniel 7, we can see we've reached the end. By following Daniel 8, we can see that we reach, have reached the end. All of these things dissolve at the right time but this big one here is still to come. And that's why when Gabriel comes to talk to Daniel, in verse 19, he says to him, I am going to tell you what will ha happen later in the time of wrath, indignation, anger. Do you know what righteous indignation is? It's God's wrath. I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. My point just at this so far is that at the time of the end, there will be a time of wrath. Does that make sense? Jan, does that make sense to you? At the time of the end, it's a time of wrath. And I want you to notice over here in Daniel 11, verse 36, talking about Satan when he comes, claiming to be God. Satan, when he appears upon the earth, claiming to have all power. Notice what the Bible says. The king. Incidentally, in Revelation 17, when Satan comes claiming to be God, Revelation 17 calls him the eighth king. 
You'll see, you'll see the, that more importantly as we study into Revelation. The king will do as he magnifies. He will exalt and magnify himself above, above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. How long will the devil be successful? Until the time of wrath has been completed. When is the time of wrath? At the appointed time of the end. And who will live? What does Revelation call the people who will live during this time period? The remnant. The remnant are the last. I mean, it only makes sense. You ever go buy a carpet remnant? Did they just take a big piece of carpet and cut off a little hunk and sell it to you? Why, no. What's happened is they sold the big, the big piece, and all that's left is the little piece. That's why it's called a remnant. This is a time of wrath. And this time of wrath is marked by seven first plagues followed by seven last plagues. Here's another important point. During this time of wrath, in the seven first plagues, it is a time of mercy. After the close of probation, after the close of mercy, we have the outpouring of God's wrath without mixture, it says in the King James Version, which means that there is no mercy mixed in. The full wrath of God will be completed. Re turn over to Revelation chapter 15. Let's look at that quite carefully to make sure that we see how it fits. Revelation 15, 1. John says, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, and he says, last, why? Because with them, God's wrath is what? Completed, fulfilled. God's wrath is poured out. Now, who gets the seven last plagues? Turn back to Revelation 14. Look at verse uh, 9. The third angel's message says, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of what? The wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup, cup, cup of his wrath. Now let me point out something here. A full cup will initiate the events that lead into the seven trumpets. Another full cup will initiate the events that lead into the seven last plagues. I'll explain that in just a second, okay? Let me review with you what the trumpets were. Incidentally, I believe the trumpets will begin sometime around 1994 or shortly thereafter. That's a personal opinion. And uh, I may be wrong. I reserve the right to be wrong. You know that. I've been wrong before. If you don't believe it, ask my wife. But I believe that at the end of the 70 Jubilees, which happens in 1994, sometime during that year, I anticipate seeing and beholding with my own eyes the events that are described right here. Now, I know that makes some of you very nervous. Good. You need to be nervous looking for the things that are coming upon this earth. The six trumpets that we have studied, the first trumpet was a great meteor shower, a series of meteors that impact the earth. As these come through the atmosphere, they are white hot. They are, they are caught, they are, um, they become very intensely hot by coming through the atmosphere at such terrific speeds. And as they impact the earth, they will ignite enormous fires. And the, John is very clear that, that one third of the trees are burned up. One third of the uh, grass is burned up. The whole earth is impacted by these fires. And these fires are so big, once a fire gets so big, you can't put it out. The best you can do, the forest rangers tell us, is to try to 
contain it. And so they get out their earth-moving equipment and they try to cut trees down. You know, at Yellowstone National Park, remember the big fire they had there a couple years ago? Uh, you just can do nothing about it. This is followed by a giant mountain, the scripture says, an asteroid impact uh, hitting the sea. And it sinks a, a large number of the ships. It um, uh, kills the creatures in the sea. And the, John says the sea, a third of the sea, looked as though it were blood. I believe he's describing an asteroid impact upon the ocean and the tidal waves that will infect the coasts, wherever, uh, whichever ocean it happens to be, will, will be d destroyed, just wiped off the face of the earth. The third trumpet is an asteroid that happens by land, hits a, a land mass, a continent, and the ground waves shear water wells and, and sewer systems and toxic waste that has been so carefully buried will be fractured and will leach into the aquifers. Millions of people will drink the, the contaminated water and die. Now, let me stop here and just make a, a very sober point. As these things are coming upon the earth, the people of earth are going to be in abject terror. True or false? It, it'll be like on the night the Titanic went down. In the ballroom, there was dancing, and there was joy, and there was partying, and there was carrying on. There was drinking and gambling and all the things that go with living it up. But when the news came that the ship was sinking, the orchestra switched from playing some of the popular dance tunes of the day and began playing Nearer My God to Thee. What do you suppose changed their minds about their selection of music? They were about to meet their maker. And it's funny that it takes this kind of impact to get some people to become serious enough about their relationship to God before they'll do anything about it. True or false? As long as times are good and money's easy, so to speak, the good life rolls on and we're, we, can, we can spend all of our time and effort and energies doing all the things we wish to do and really never give serious, earnest thought to our relationship to Jesus Christ. Let alone, let alone not even considering what Jesus Christ wants of us. Most people think of a relationship with Jesus Christ as merely coming into a, an ascent to what truth is, coming to understand what truth is. But, you know, God says he wants us to become what he wants us to be. It's not enough to know the truth. The devil knows the truth. If you knew all the truth, you'd be no better than the devil, intellectually. But God wants you to do something. He wants you to become something that he can use to take the gospel. Every one of you, every child of God who becomes born again is born into his kingdom, a missionary, and you're given a mission. Off your seat, on your feet, down the street. But the church has lost sight of that. Christians have lost sight of that. And today, about the most, the most uh, direct things that we, we, we often do is get up and go to church. That spills up and sums up the total Christian experience. And that's, that's just the beginning. God has much greater things for us to do. And if you understand these things, guess, guess what you're going to be doing during this time? You're going to be standing on an apple crate and you're going to say, folks, if you think this is something, this is coming next. And they'll say, how do you know? And you'll say, it's because it's written right here in the Bible. Nah, you're kidding me. All of these things were written down so that when they should come to pass, we could look to the God's Word as a light shining in a dark place. You want to know what's coming next? You don't need to run Ask Gene Dixon. You don't need to buy the National Enquirer. Open your Bible. 
It's written right there in plain English, fortunately. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to open your Bible and figure out what the fourth trumpet is or the fifth or the sixth once things begin to unfold. To anyone and to everyone who wants... You see, the reason that it works this way, God is going to draw attention to His Holy Word in this time of wrath. And that's why in the second seal, remember the cause that's sent throughout the earth is the distribution of what? The sword of truth. What is, what is it? The Bible. Why would God want the Bible distributed throughout the world? So people can read for themselves and know the way to salvation. I think that's wonderful. Now listen, I know some of you think I'm just crazy. You've told me that. And when I began teaching about, um, let's see, I guess it was in 1989 that I publicly went on record, went on tape, stating that I believe the trumpets are caused by asteroids and meteorites, people thought that I had just, I mean, they were already suspicious of me. But this was, this removed all doubt. The guy's nuts. Friends, I want to tell you something. I, I may be nuts. I don't discount that. But I believe that God's word is rather clear on what he's saying here. Predicting the coming of the asteroids and the meteorites in our day is no stranger than Noah predicting rain. Both, both will fall out of heaven. Water and rocks. Now, I was very pleasantly surprised in April. I went down to Arkansas, and um, there a, a friend had gone over to the Moody Bible Institute, and he had gotten a copy of a book called Daniel and the Apocalypse by Josiah Litch. Josiah Litch was a prominent pastor and theologian during the Millerite movement. And in fact, it was Josiah Litch who in 1838 believed that the, second, uh, that the sixth trumpet represented the fall of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And uh, in 1839, Josiah Litch published this in a number of newspapers, and he predicted the day to be August 11, 1840, that the Ottoman Turkish Empire would fall. Uh, uh, at that time, Josiah Litch believed that Christ was coming in 1844, and he believed that the sixth trumpet was a, was a herald announcing the soon coming Christ. 1840, remember, is just four years before 1844. So Josiah Litch went on record and explaining, and, and he had this all cooked up, explaining how that the sixth trumpet was the fall of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And something did happen on August 11, 1840, which created a real sensation among the Millerites. They thought that the pre peace treaty signed between Turkey and Egypt was a fulfillment of Josiah Litch's prophecy. And of course, that just, that immediately fueled the flames of the Millerite movement. And Jesus really is coming. The sixth trumpet has just been fulfilled. They had seen a great asteroid uh, or meteoric shower in 1833. So here we are seven years later, and we're seeing the fulfillment. Certainly it was a time of great expectation. And people were all anxious around the 1844 time, believing that Jesus was coming. After 1844 passed, Josiah Litch changed his mind. He said that what he had called the sixth trumpet and what he had anticipated was in fact and in reality a non-event. He thought it was a fulfillment. At the, at the moment it happened, it looked like a fulfillment. But he said, no, it wasn't a fulfillment. 
Now, obviously, a lot of people disagreed with him. They said, no, nope, it was a fulfillment. You can't change your mind. We won't let you because Jesus is coming right away. And a lot of people to this day hang on to the idea that the sixth trumpet was fulfilled in that time, even though there is no historical basis upon which to build that fact. The Ottoman Turkish Empire did not fall by any stretch of the imagination until around 1919 at the end of World War I. Turkey became a sovereign nation, incidentally, at, uh, during the time of World War I, and uh, to this day is still regarded a sovereign nation. In 1872, Josiah Litch wrote the book Daniel and the Apocalypse. In this book, he goes on to explain that he believes that the trumpets are yet future. And he's convinced that they will, they will come right before the coming of Jesus to awaken the world to the fact that Christ is coming. 1872. Now, I had no knowledge of this until last month. Yeah, last month. And so I was very curious to read what Josiah Litch, Dr. Litch, has to say about the trumpets. I'd like to read from page uh, 158. The falling of meteors of various sizes is so common an event, and the evidence of the existence of such bodies in space so abundant that there need be nothing incredible in the fall of one so bitter as to embitter the waters of the rivers and the fountains and to poison the water and those who drink from them. In fact, as you read all of his statements about the, the trumpets, he's very convinced that the first trumpet is a meteor shower, the second trumpet is a great asteroid that impacts the sea, and the third is a great asteroid that impacts the land and causes the contamination of water. And I thought I was the only one that was nuts. 1870, over a hundred years earlier, Dr. Litch came to the same conclusion. The purpose of these trumpets is to awaken the world that Christ is coming. I want to make two more points here. The fifth trumpet is the physical appearing of the devil, claiming to be God. Now, the saints will know when Satan is coming because they can count. One, two, three, four. Charles, that's not funny. It's just the truth. <laughs> they will know what's coming next. And they will not be surprised, nor caught off guard, nor be caught embarrassed that Satan is coming unannounced. Would you like to see that explained a little clearly, more clearly? Turn to Revelation 17, verse 8. I read this verse to you the other night, but I want to go back and point out something here. The beast that comes up out of the abyss is the angel that comes up out of the abyss. And in the, in the Revelation 9, who is the angel king who comes up out of the abyss? The devil and his wicked angels. Now, in Revelation 17, 8, the beast that you saw which once was visible is now is not visible and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be what? Astonished. They will be amazed. They will be overwhelmed when they, what's the next word? See or behold the devil. Because he once was visible, now is not visible, and yet will come up out of the abyss as a visible being. The people of the world will be astonished when they see him. 
You ever heard the old expression, seeing is believing? The devil knows he has but one opportunity to deceive the inhabitants of the earth. It's a very short time period. The fifth trumpet's, put, let's put it right there. He has a short, I think, personally, I, the Bible doesn't tell us for sure, but I believe that Satan is up on the earth prior to the close of probation for in a period of time in excess of a year, perhaps as long as two years. Time to do an enormous amount of damage. We do know that the fifth trumpet is five, the suffering of those who don't have the seal of God is five months long. So we know that it, that's a pretty good uh, time period of great intense suffering. Revelation calls this fifth trumpet the first of three curses or woes. And a, a curse or a woe is something that expressly falls upon a certain body of people. And who gets this one? Those who don't have the seal of God. The second is a great terrible woe because it is a global civil war. Now this is an important point. I explained to you how that in each continent, in each nation, Satan will have established followers that believe in him as God. And after he has enough followers believing that he is God, he will lead his followers in each country to wage civil war to take control of the world for him. And if you look at Revelation 9, <clears throat> starting at verse 13 down to the end of the chapter, you'll discover that this is a great war and one-third of mankind will be killed in this war. What, was, what has been the bloodiest war that Americans have ever fought? Well, isn't that amazing? The Civil War. This civil war, the reason that there is so much bloodshed is because it happens internally to every nation. You know, if like in the Iraqi-American war, the, just because the war was not fought on American soil, but entirely over there in the desert, we lost very few Americans. Right? But if the war had been fought here in Ohio and had been fought in California, and had been fought in Texas, and had been fought in Ethiopia, and had been fought in Australia, can't you see how the casualties would immediately become unbelievable? The whole world will be in a fight. And it is Satan leading this fight to take control of the world. And I'll explain in our study on the two beasts what mechanisms he uses to control and to gain control of the world. But after Satan has been successful, the scriptures clearly tell us in Daniel, he will be successful until the time of wrath is what? Completed. When Satan has finally been successful and gained control of the world, he sets his throne in Jerusalem and he goes to take his seat. And at the end of the time he sits down, what does Michael in heaven do? Stand up. This is where we find the beginning of the seven last plagues, which incidentally is the third woe. The third woe is seven last plagues that are poured out upon those who receive the mark of the beast. Three curses. They are terrible. We cannot, un we can't even conceptualize them, but we shall see them. After Satan has gained control of the world, he divides the world up into ten kingdoms. Ten kingdoms toes. And these kings who will be presidents of these kingdoms will rule with Satan for a short time because this time period here is quite short. I'm convinced at this present time that the time period of the seven last plagues is approximately seven months. Now, I'm not going to go into an explanation on that right now, but I believe that it works out to about a plague a month. This will be a horrible time. Now, from the, from the text that we have in Daniel, I believe that this whole time period, this whole time of wrath, that
that when God gave it to Daniel, it represented 1,335 days. From the taking away of the daily until the abomination that causes desolation is set up is 1,290 days. This is the universal death decree, and I'll be talking more about that. I just can't talk about everything at one time. But the Bible says, blessed is he that waits for and reaches the 1,335. The blessing that he's going to get for having waited and reached for and endured and stood firm to the very end, he's going to hear Jesus say when he comes in the clouds, come, ye blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Is that a blessing you'd like to receive? Blessed are those who wait for and reach the 1335. That's what it means. Well, I want to take you back now to Revelation chapter 8, verse 2. In the study of these things, you can't always be linear. It's too big. And so I try to explain this and this and this and this and these little pieces around. And soon, as you begin to wrestle with them yourself and become acquainted with them, you begin to place the pieces too and the lights will come on. So it takes a little bit of mental effort. Here we are today. This is um, May 18, 1991. Here is 1994. It is my understanding that in 1994, the 70th Jubilee will be reached. And I anticipate personally, I could be wrong, but I personally anticipate the first trumpet to happen in November or December of that year, perhaps as late as January, as we pass through the Leonid asteroid belt. <coughs> now, there's a couple of events that takes place prior to that time, and those things we will expect to see back here. There are two events that we should anticipate prior to the meteoric shower, and I'm going to show you one of them right now. Revelation 8, verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Now, you know what a censer is? A little, little skillet, a little bowl. And he's got a uh, lot of incense. And he's going to take this incense and put it on the altar of incense. And it will fill up the whole area with a wonderful fragrance. My wife wears a, a very sweet-smelling perfume. And I can tell when she has been in certain rooms of the house without seeing her in there, just by sniffing the air. And that sweet smell always reminds me of sweet Shirley. Now, I don't want to get too mushy here, you understand, but... I, I, I remember in one seminar, I was, I was pointing out how that that it was so wonderful to, to smell a sweet-smelling woman. And one lady in the audience said, well, that goes for men, too. <laughs> this, uh, this angel is uh, before the throne of God, and he comes there to offer this incense, and the prayers of God ascend with it. And the prayers of, saint, of the saints ascend before God. Now, what I'm about to say is very important. I believe that when the, sin, the incense is put on the altar and the prayers of God's people ascend with it, that that is describing to us 
that God's people know what is about to take place. Otherwise, why would the prayers of any other day be different? Let me show you why, I'm, why I understand it this way. Go back to Revelation 5. Look at verse 8. Now we're going back to 1844. This is talking about Jesus. And when he had taken the book sealed with seven seals, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding what? Golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Here's my point. In 1844, as Jesus was beginning to receive this book and to begin his ministry as our high priest, there was a group of people upon earth anticipating something was going to happen in 1844 and their prayers were ascending in a respective way. Their prayers were coming up before God. There was a great revival. There was reformation. There was seeking forgiveness. There was repentance. There was making things right and restitution. There was a preparation going on, and it's represented here in Revelation 5. It's happening in 1844 because the prayers of the saints were ascending, albeit for the wrong reason. They thought Jesus was coming, but nevertheless, their prayers were ascending in 1844 because they thought the end had come. I believe when we get to Revelation chapter 8, the difference is, is that the saints now know the time of the end has come because Revelation's story has been unfolded. Prophetic things are only understood on or about the time of fulfillment. And because Revelation is now cracking open and we can understand its story, that means unequivocally that the time of fulfillment is not far from now. If this message were to go around for another 200 years, you know what would be the condition of the people? About like today. <laughs> About like today, indifferent and drowsy and sleepy. No, this message is going to go in ever-increasing, widening circles until it envelops the whole world. Revelation's story has got to be told again. We just got to get a few pieces in the right places and all of the harmony will come together and we will see that we are living in the last days of earth's history. And when you see these events take place, there won't be any doubt in your mind. But I must tell you this before we take our five minute break. If you take a wait and see attitude, if by faith you can't see these things, you're in trouble. What happened to the people in Noah's day who took a wait and see attitude? They perished. You see, the real test is to see who can live by faith. In the parable of the ten virgins, at midnight, the cry rang out, Behold, the bridegroom comes. There was a startling emergency. There was a startling awakening. And when the awakening occurred, the foolish could not get prepared. It's going to be the same way, dear friend. Instead of having 50 or 60 people present in a study at that day, Thousands will knock on the door and say, can we have a Bible study? I think this would be a good time. I'd like to know what this is all about. In Noah's day, they said, no, we think we'd like to get in the, bar in the ark now. They beat on the door, Noah, Noah, let us in. This is life and death. Noah said, yes, that's what I've been trying to tell you for 120 years. It's life and death. When these events begin, the door is open to those who have not heard the gospel, but the door of mercy is closed to those who've had an opportunity. That's the case of the wise and the foolish.
Let's take a five minute intermission and then we'll continue. In Revelation chapter 8, we find an event that takes place in heaven which has a corresponding physical event on earth. If you are tuned in to what's going on in heaven, you will recognize what is happening on earth, not the other way around. If you want to know what's coming upon the earth, you won't find it in the Wall Street Journal. You won't find it in U.S. News and World Report. You won't find it in any magazine. You will find it in the Bible. This is God's Word. And God always allows His children to know what He's going to do in advance so that His children can work with Him as they go through this and accomplish what He wants done. The more that you understand what God is trying to do and how tenderly He goes about doing it, the more that you will the fear of all of these things evaporate. This isn't to say that we won't have hard times. On the contrary, we're going to go through a time of trouble such as the world has never seen. But the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's what faith means. He leadeth me through the valleys of the shadow of death, but I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. It's got to be that kind of experience. Would you give your life if God required it or asked of, of you? Would you give your life to, to see many souls saved for his kingdom, for eternity? If you valued eternity properly, you would say yes. And as you look down through history at the martyrs and at those who have stood firm for their faith, they have always done so, praying that their life and, or, and their death would only cause the kingdom of God to flourish. It's a hard thing to give up your life. In fact, Jesus says there is no greater love than a man give up his life for a friend. If Jesus is your friend. If, you, if he is really your friend, you'd be willing to follow him to death if necessary. Is that right or wrong? When the censor is carried into before the throne with this incense that is put upon this and then the censer in the angel's hand, in verse 5, the angel throws the censer down, indicating that the usefulness and the work of and the function of the censer is over. It's terminated. It's finished. The throwing down of the censer marks the end of the daily in heaven. Now, let me explain something. We talk about the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. And you've heard me talk long and, and very lengthy on that point. Jesus is found worthy to cleanse and to remove the sin of the sanctuary. If there is a cleansing of the sanctuary, there has to be a daily in which the, off, the, sin offer, excuse me, the sins of the people in a corporate way are carried into the sanctuary. Let's go back to the daily for a minute. Morning and evening, every day in Israel, there was the sacrifice of a one-year-old flawless lamb. Morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening, every day of the week, and even on the Day of Atonement. The high priest officiated on the offering that morning. 
This is the one time in the year that the high priest himself presents the morning sacrifice. Now this sacrifice does not have to do with being found worthy, the sacrifice of the bull, nor the two goats. This is the daily. The daily is an ongoing process so that God can dwell in the camp of Israel. Without this atonement or this constant offering that God is, is making available, he, if he came down to dwell in their camp, he would kill them all. What happened on Mount Sinai? He told Moses, you tell them not to come up on this mountain, not to touch it, or I will break out against them and they shall die. How can one that is almighty and holy dwell in the presence of sinful flesh without consuming it? Only through this atonement. Understand that this, uh, that this offering is a corporate offering. That means that it atoned for all the camp, everybody, all day long, all night long. The morning took care of the day. The evening took care of the night. Does that make sense? When Jesus ceases to be our daily, when Adam and Eve sinned, who stepped in to make atonement? Jesus Christ. He immediately stepped in and said, Father, don't destroy them. Adam willfully sinned. He knew better, but don't destroy them. I will step in and be their atonement. Jesus became our daily. On a, on a credit card. The credit card will, will, is, or was, that someday he would pay the price. 4,000 years later, with interest, he paid the price. He, as our daily, died on Calvary. Now, when Jesus died on Calvary, he also died as the sin offering. He died as two offerings on Calvary. The sin offering is the offering where the sinner came and brought his own lamb, sorry for his own sins. But dear friends, the sinner could have never come and brought his own offering if there hadn't been corporate atonement so he could get there in the first place. You understand that? If this, if this wasn't going on, you could never get there with your own offering because there would be no way to approach him to God. You'd be destroyed before you got there. My point is, is that I believe that at the end of 70 Jubilees, the corporate intercession of Jesus comes to an end. And that is what is explained here in the 8th chapter of Revelation. That's why the censer is thrown down. You see, in heaven, there is, there is no need for animal sacrifices because Jesus is the lamb that was slain. But there is continual need for atonement, and the instrument of the censer is our clue. Turn with me back to Numbers chapter 16. Now, we're not going to take the time to read this whole chapter. I hope that you'll make a little mental note, or just write it on the top of your hand. Read Numbers 16, in case you're prone to forget things. This is the story of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And these three guys, along with 250 other leaders of Israel, caused a rebellion in the camp of Israel. And these two, three guys, along with the 250, they came marching very proudly up to the headquarters where Moses and Aaron lived. And they said... Um, we're tired of you guys trying to run the ship around here and telling us what to do. We don't like the way you're doing things, and we think that you're no more holy than the rest of us. Now, we've, we've decided that we will run the program here. And, uh, oh boy. Look at verse uh, 3. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. 
You are too uppity for us. Those were my words. I just catch that. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? See, they were trying to, to say, well, Moses, you and Aaron, you guys are no better than the rest of us. You put your pants on just like we do. I guess they wore pants back then. I don't remember. The point is they're trying to say, you guys, you guys have set yourselves up to be something that you shouldn't think of. And the Bible says here in verse 4, when Moses heard this, he fell face down. And then he said, in the morning, the Lord will show who belongs to him and who is holy. And he will have that person come near to him. The man he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Now, coming near to God is a very scary thing. To come near to that presence of that power, to, to be able to stand worthily in God's presence is no human achievement. It cannot be humanly done. And so Moses is saying, all right, we will test it. We will put this before the Lord, and the one the Lord calls to come near him, that person will be holy. And then verse 6, you, Korah, and all your followers are to do this. Take censers, little skillets, and tomorrow put fire and incense in them before the Lord. The man the Lord chooses will be the one who is holy. You Levites have gone too far. Okay, so the next day, um, they, they appeared before Moses and Aaron. And uh, uh, verse 20, let's see, let's jump down to verse uh, 16. Moses said to Korah, You and all your followers are to appear before the Lord tomorrow, you and they and Aaron. Each man is to take his censer and put incense in it, 250 censers in all, and present it before the Lord. You and Aaron are to present your censers also. So each man took his censer, put fire and incense in it, and stood with Moses and Aaron at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The, the term tent of meeting is the, same ref, is the same as the sanctuary. It's just a different title for the same little building. When Korah had gathered all of his followers in opposition to them at the entrance of the tent of meeting, the glory of the Lord appeared to the entire assembly, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Separate yourselves from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. But Moses and Aaron fell face down and cried out, O oh God, God of the spirits of all mankind, will you be angry with the entire assembly when only one man sins? Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the assembly, Move away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Moses got up and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed, and he warned the assembly, Move back from the tents of these wicked men. Do not touch anything belonging to them, or you will be swept away because of their sins. So they moved away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Dathan and Abiram had come out and were standing with their wives, children, and little ones at the entrance to their tents. Then Moses said, this is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things and that it is not my idea. If these men die a natural death and experience only what usually happens to men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings something totally new and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them with everything that belongs to them and they go down alive into the grave, then you will know that these men have treated the Lord with contempt. And as soon as he finished saying this, the ground under them split apart, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them. With their households and Korah's men and all their possessions, they went down alive into the grave with everything they owned. The earth closed over them and they perished and were gone from the community. Wow. Verse 35, the rest of the community runs around and says, the earth is going to swallow us too. And verse 35 says, and the fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. The Lord said to Moses, tell Eleazar, son of Aaron, 
the priest to take the censers out of the smoldering remains and scatter the coal some distance away, for the censers are holy. The censers of the men who sinned at the cost of their lives and hammer the censers into sheets of overlay of gold to overlay the altar, for they were presented before the Lord and have become holy. Let them be a sign to the Israelites. Then, look up at verse 46. The children of Israel grumbled the next day, You have killed the Lord's people. Then Moses said to Aaron, verse 46, Take your censer and put some incense in it, along with fire from the altar, and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. So Aaron did as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered the incense and made atonement for them. He stood between who? The living and the dead, and the plague stopped. But 14,700 people died from the plague in addition to those who had died because of Korah. I want you to understand from this story that the censer is a crucial instrument in the atoning process. It was the censer that Aaron run and stood between the living and the dead. It is the censer that is thrown down in Revelation 8, which indicates that we have come to the end of the corporate intercession of the ministry of Christ, and the result is the outbreak of the wrath of God. Does that make sense? Here's the time of wrath. Here's the seven first, here's the seven last. Here's the throwing down of the censer. Throwing down of the censers happens just shortly before the first trumpet. And that's why if you go back to Revelation chapter 8, look at this very carefully. Verse 6. You will notice that after the censer is thrown down and there's a great earthquake on the earth, fire, uh, rumblings, lightning, peals of thunder, and an earthquake. Verse 6 says, Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. They don't sound them immediately. They get ready to sound them when the time is right. There's a little pause there. I believe this earthquake could likely happen in the spring to the middle of 1994, and I believe that the first trumpet, which marks the beginning of the wrath of God, will happen shortly thereafter, perhaps in November or December of 94. These are my own opinions, and I want to clearly express that to you. The Bible doesn't say, but the Bible does indicate to me three important things. First, there is an order. When we see this earthquake, we can know this is happening. And I believe that the saints will know that it's about to happen because we have the prayers of the saints ascending because they understand what's about to come. Just like in Revelation 5. Now, during the time period of the seven trumpets, I'm going to mark this time period in red here, there's a very marvelous thing that happens. The purpose of the trumpets are to awaken the people of earth to hear the everlasting gospel. But who's going to give the everlasting gospel? The 144,000. Let's look at that if we can. Revelation chapter 7. Now, let me draw something on the, on the line here. Please look at the board here for a second. We have the apocalyptic story of Revelation 4 through 6. This is the story of the six seals. Now, there are seven seals. But understand that the seventh seal is not in this story. It's in another story. 
And then the reason for that, it will become more obvious later on. These first three seals around 1844, these next three seals around the second coming. I believe that the fourth seal is the next seal to open. And I believe that the opening of the fourth seal, we get the four judgments of God, sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. Remember? Kills 25% of the earth. We find in the opening of the fourth seal that from here to here, 1.25 billion people will perish. A number beyond comprehension. 25% of the earth, 1.25 billion people. I believe that the opening of the fourth seal is marked by the earthquake of the trumpets. So that I would draw the trumpets then, the trumpet story from here down to about right there. What I'm trying to show you is how these pieces will line up chronologically. Each apocalyptic story, and there are 12 of them. Here's one of them. Here's one of them. This one is about six seals. This one's about six trumpets. There are seven trumpets, but there's, this is the sixth trumpet story. The seventh trumpet is in another story. There's an interesting reason why we have the six seal story and the six trumpet story, and they both are seven units long. I'll have to explain that later. What I'm trying to show you is that the opening of the fourth seal and the throwing down of the censer represents the same thing. Because the wrath of God, without the daily, without the corporate intercession for Jesus, the wrath of God breaks out upon the earth. It moves us from the judgment of the dead, which began in 1844, to the judgment of the living, which will conclude with the close of probation. Am I going too fast? Thank you, Lois. Now, Revelation chapter 7 is another story, and that story fits in here. Look up here. That story fits in here like this. And then it has a piece over here like this. I don't know if you can see my, how small my marks are. And then it has another piece I've run out of paper. I could go over here and mark on the wall. But the seventh seal is the third piece of the story and it's way out here. This, this follows the rule of interpretation, which says an apocalyptic sequence always has a beginning point, always has an ending point, and they always have to happen in the order in which they're given. They're not always side by side. In other words, there's a time period of, you can see there's a time lapse between the third seal and the fourth in here, about 150 years. There's a time lapse between these. There's a time lapse between these. The point is, is that the rule simply says A, B, C, D. It has to follow in order. They don't have to be right next to each other chronologically. There can be years of time between them. Revelation 7, 1. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land, notice, land, sea, or tree. I've got to write this down. Land, sea, or tree. What are the angels holding back? Four winds to prevent harm to the land, the sea, or trees. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to do what? To hurt or to harm the land and the sea, saying, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the forehead of the servants of our God. And the number that are sealed are how many? 144,000. Now, 
Do you know where? Well, let me ask this question first. Does it make sense to you that after the 144,000 are sealed, that the land, the sea, and the trees are going to be harmed? The point here is, Baird, that when the four angels let go, they have power to harm the land, the sea, and the trees. It's clearly stated here. Don't harm. Don't harm these things until God's people are ready, his servants. Don't do your work of destruction until God's servants are ready. And when God's servants are ready, then do your destruction. The four winds represent the four judgments. Sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. And these are being held back. The fourth seal, the opening of the fourth seal is being held back by these four angels until the 144,000 are ready. And when they are ready, and when they have been sealed and, and selected, I should say selected and sealed, get it in the right order, then guess what's going to happen? They're going to let go because the censor is going to be thrown down, the daily is finished, and the judgments that have been promised are going to take off. Gladys? That's exactly right. They are. Let's notice the, d the destruction of the land and the sea and the trees that are contained in the first two trumpets. Look at Revelation 8, verse 7. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Now, the word for earth, a third of the earth was burned up. The word for earth there is gneo, Greek gneo. In Revelation 7, do not harm the land. The same word there is gneo. In one place it's translated land, in another place it's translated earth. The point is, it's the same thing. And we find that the land and the trees get hurt in the first angel's work. And then in the second trumpet, we find something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned to blood. A third of the sea creatures died and a third of the ships were destroyed. What I'm trying to say to you is that John describes the four angels holding back the judgments of God. They are holding back the angels who are going to deliver the trumpets. Does that make sense? Bill, does that make sense to you? The four angels are holding back the, the, the angels who will deliver the wrath of God. This is a time of wrath. Seven first plagues, seven last plagues. Now let me point out something here that's going to be very difficult and it's going to fall upon the shoulders of each one of us here. During the time period of these judgments, are you going to stand on an apple crate and say, God is love? Yes, you are. You're going to say to the people of earth, in God's great love, this is the only last recourse to which he could take this planet in order to save as many as possible. For 2,000 years, the gospel has been presented and it cannot make any further inroad. It's going nowhere. The gospel is not accomplishing what it should be doing. And God's cup of patience has reached its limit, so now he is going to 
open up, if you will, exposure to his wrath while there is still mercy to be saved. And the, and the, and the destruction and the things coming up on the earth in this time period are nothing compared to eternal life with Christ. God is love. And he's having to chasten and to discipline and to spank, if you will, the world because it has reached a point of no return. Every, all through the ages, God has sent messages of mercy, messages of love, messages of long-suffering, messages of kindness and graciousness and His love. And what is it doing? Is the world becoming a better place for it? No. You see, we have a wrong and very screwed up concept of what love is. True love is the balance between justice and mercy. God has in mercy dealt long and in patience dealt long with the waywardness of mankind. But there is a full cup. There is a point of no return. And we will reach that full cup, I believe, in just two or three years. About three and a half years. And then these events, I anticipate, will commence. One thing about the thing I'm, I'm, I'm explaining here, I don't want you to think that because I'm convinced it's that near at hand, and if it doesn't happen, I don't want you to say, well, I'm going to throw that all away. That, that was just a false alarm. No, I don't want you to do that at all. The timing of this, when you see it, you'll recognize it for yourself. Well, if God chooses to delay a little longer, that's his business. After all, he's the one that's in control, right? <laughs> so if I'm wrong on that point, don't throw away your confidence in God's word. Throw away your confidence in me. That's much better. But I believe that, at least conceptually, that the scriptures, the harmony of all the pieces, are coming together unmistakably clear. Now, another thing about this is that if I am wrong, we won't have to wait long to see. And that's encouraging too. If I was talking about something that was going to happen 100 years from now, big deal. That's out of our lifetime, right? We won't worry about that. Put that away. But I believe that this message is growing because the Holy Spirit is awakening people's minds and their hearts to the realization that Jesus is coming soon. And when I use the word soon, I don't mean 25 centuries. I don't mean three centuries. I mean eminently within this decade. This time period, as I told you before the break, is 1,335 days. I believe in Matthew 24, Jesus has tell, told, tells us that it's actually been shortened or no one would live to see the 1,335th day. In other words, we are working from a model of all the pieces that tells us this is 1,335 days. But when Jesus was walked the earth six, 500 years after giving this prophecy to Daniel, he tells us that these days have been shortened or no one would live. It's that bad. So this represents a maximum. And you should have noticed that in the day star that you got uh, for the month of May. That's at least the way I understand it. So the 144,000 are being selected and sealed prior to the earthquake. Does that make sense? Let me talk about the 144,000 for a minute. The 144,000 in Revelation 7, verse 3, are called servants. You see that? Revelation 7, verse 3, they are called servants. Okay? All through the scriptures, you will find an interesting distinction 
between the servants and the saints that live during the time of wrath. Let's get the time of wrath up here. Seven first, seven last. During this time period of the seven first plagues, the seven trumpets, the 144,000 are going to be given special powers for 1260 days to proclaim the gospel. In other words, God is going, th think of the seven trumpets as a seven alarm fire. What do we mean by a seven alarm fire? Well, when a fire gets started, they ring the bell and the closest fire station rushes to it. If the fire is larger than one fire station can handle, they ring another bell and the next closest fire station comes. That's a two alarm fire. Then if those two can't handle it, they ring another bell and you get a three alarm fire and more fire stations come to help. You understand how it works? This is a seven alarm fire. God is going to unplug every possible means to save every soul that he can. Now, you heard me say, I believe, in our second study that the more brightly shines the will of God, the more resistant the will of wicked people. God is going to have his message and his gospel presented with such clarity, with such simplicity, with such power that you've got to be hardened of heart to, re to refuse it. And multitudes will harden their hearts. God is going to give his servants, the 144,000, special power during this time and in fact, all through the story of Revelation, they are called prophets. Let's see how that works. Look at Revel turn over to Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. Excuse, excuse me, verse chapter 10, verse 7. We want to start there first. I have instant recall. It just doesn't work. Revelation 10, verse 7. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, right down here, this is right here, it's where the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, what? Servants, the prophets. servants, the prophets. You see, during this time period, the gospel is, incidentally, you know what the mystery of God is? That Jesus Christ has died on Calvary as your sacrifice. That Jesus Christ as your high priest is your intercessor. And Jesus Christ in heavenly sanctuary is about to conclude his work there. If you are willing to live by faith, if you're willing to be what he wants you to be, willing to go where he'd have you go, and willing to do what he asks you to do, you can have life eternal. I don't care how bad you've been. The mystery of God, that is, he can save anyone. He can grant salvation to anyone who will meet the terms of the covenant. Is that right? The mystery of God will be completed, will be fulfilled, will be finalized at the time of the seventh trumpet. That's how we know that mercy ends and the seven last plagues are then to fall. So we find here that the servants, the prophets, they're the ones who announces, who carry the message that had been given to them. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Servants, the prophets. Look at Revelation 11, verse 18. The time, the nations were angry. This is at the time of the seventh trumpet, right here. That's where we're talking about right now. Revelation 11, 18. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. Oh, dear. What wrath are we talking about? The seven last plagues. You see, the seventh trumpet is an announcement that probation is closed. 
and there will be a great earthquake at that time, and the saints will know that mercy has come to an end, and it's time to close shop and run for their lives. The reason they're going to run for their lives is because the wicked will be after them. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great. My point here is that the servants and the saints are two separate groups of people. They're identified as such. Flip over here to Revelation chapter 18. In verse 24, talking about the martyrdom of the saints and the martyrdom of the prophets. Watch what the Bible says. In verse 24, Revelation 18, 24, In her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and of all who have been killed upon the earth. People have said to me, Well, Larry, isn't that talking about the prophets all down through the history of the world and down through all the ages? No, no, no. I'll show you. Flip back, if you will, to Revelation 16. I wanted you to notice, though, in Revelation 18, the servants, the prophets, and the saints are separate groups of people. Now, Revelation 16, verse 4. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became his blood. And notice what the angel in heaven says. The angel who does it. The angel who pours out the third plague. I heard the angel in charge of the water say, speaking to Jesus, you are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your what? Saints and prophets. And you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Well, now look at the board. Look up here. Here is the third plague. See that black line? Who gets the third plague? Which wicked? Who? Look at the Bible. What does it say? Verse 6. Who gets the third plague? Absolutely. Charles, those who have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. And the angel says to Jesus, you are fair in doing this. You are in avenging their... I've told you there is martyrdom coming in the fifth seal. This is the confirmation that it has occurred. And now the third plague is poured out upon those who did it. Do you understand that? Claudia, does that make sense? That's a deep thought. Eleanor, does that make sense? Ruth? The people who get the third plague are those who killed the saints and the prophets. What prophets? Who are the prophets? 144,000. I believe the Bible clearly teaches that some of the 144,000 will be killed. I believe that the Bible teaches that some of the saints will be killed. And I believe that the opening of the fifth seal, the martyrdom over the Word of God, happens after Satan has arrived in the fifth trumpet. Fifth trumpet first, fifth seal follows. Now, those of you who have a copy of my apocalyptic chart, you need to go back and look at these things. Understanding the story, how it chronologically unfolds, is very crucial to understanding what the story says. And you have to understand the order of events in order to appreciate what God is doing and why He's doing it and what it, why it's so important. The 144,000 come from 12 tribes. This is not literal Israel, Israeli tribes or Jewish tribes. 
These are spiritual Israel. God will choose them. He will choose people of 12 different types, personality, character types. And I may be looking at some of them right here this afternoon. When you take the population of the world and you divide it by 144,000, out of every 35,000 people, you get one of these servants. This means, well, that's a large parish, isn't it? I mean, if you're the pastor of that parish, you've got your hands full. That means a city the size of Dayton and the surrounding area would have approximately 25 of these people in, its, in this area. In the United States of America, we would have approximately 7,500 of these people. Out of 144,000, the rest of them would be spread around the world. If, if it is all equally distributed, 1 to 35,000. Dear friends, I want to tell you this in closing. You know at Christmas time how you put the tree, the, the tree up and then you put the lights and you string them all around? And then finally, the moment of truth comes. You plug in the lights. And all around the tree, those little lights come on and begin to sparkle and give off their light. In other words, those little lights do what they're supposed to do. God, in the last 150 years, has been putting the lights around the earth. Because at the proper time, he's going to plug into the power of the Holy Spirit all these people who are ready. And they're going to shine like stars. In our closing text, turn to Daniel 12, verse 3. Daniel 12, verse 3. I want you to look at this very carefully. Those who are wise. If you have a King James Version, or even if you have a New International Version, you should notice it's those who impart wisdom. In the, in the King James Version, it says those who are teachers. They will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like what? The stars forever and ever. You see, in God's economy, the stars of Hollywood are nothing. If anything, they're an abomination. In God's economy, the real stars are those who reflect His character. The real stars are those who tell others of His love. The real stars are those who lead others to know Jesus and to give their lives to Him. I'd like to encourage you to set your sail to become a star for Jesus. Let your light so shine that others may see God in you. And you will have a glorious part to play in these final, rapid, closing moments. Well, I hope the trumpets make a little more sense now than they did a week ago. Let's stand for the benediction. Our Father which art in heaven, we're so thankful for Jesus and for the power of the Holy Spirit, the gift that Jesus has given to lead us into truth, to help us to understand what he is doing and what he's about to do. Certainly these things are sober and sobering. These things are more than we can comprehend. But we know as we look to you, that light that shines in a dark place, that as we wait for and as we do all that we can to hasten the coming of Jesus, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you for loving us and caring for us and for helping us to understand we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you for coming. We'll look forward to seeing you Tuesday evening at about 7 o'clock. We just have five studies left. Can you believe it, how fast it's going? So we'll see you Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock.